This podcast is brought to you by Blackbee Ministries International. To find out more, visit blackbee.org. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Richard Blackaby Leadership Podcast. My name is Sam, and I'm your host, and I'm joined by Richard Blackaby. Good to be with you, Sam. It's good to have you with us. We've, uh, I guess, we're. This is kind of like the the week of the snake. I think. Is that, uh, <laughs> we've, bo- we've both had snake spottings. I I had house. a big black snake right in my front window, the front of my house. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was actually just downstairs preparing a video talk on leadership in crisis. And all of a sudden I heard every female in my house screaming. <laughs> <laughs> I realized I was about to have a fresh new illustration yeah. as this black snake was looking at entering my garage, open garage door. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I saw one that's probably about three feet long in my backyard. Well, and, was it a uh, king snake? Or no, I think it was... Uh, from my bit of research, I think it was a rat snake. A rat snake. Yeah, which are not venomous. Those black ones aren't. All right, I've been told black no, just in general. Yeah, black it's snakes. A, it's are. A, it was a black snake, and again, uh, <clears throat> I should state that neither of us are snake snake, experts. snake, <laughs> snakeologists. <laughs> snake- <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I think it was, it was just a, it was a black yeah. snake. And when everyone says, "Oh, don't worry, that's a good snake," I wanted. Yeah, to think. but I didn't know there was the, such you a. You just get the shivers when you see that thing. Just yeah. He was just going right through the grass, you know, and yeah. What'd you do? And What'd you do to it? I just kind of f- flung him out of the yard there. Yeah. Because who wa- who wants to have rats around? But yeah, that's right. It's like, what do you, what do you want? Uh, uh, you know, a big rodents, or do you want a snake? A well-fed to... snake in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So yeah. So we've had uh, some adventures this week. Yes, we have. Living indeed. in the south. Oh yeah. It's getting hot down here for mm. sure. So today we want to pick up where we left off um, on episode 95 of the show. We uh, looked at part two of the life and leadership of Elijah. Yeah. Um, you've, you've actually written a book, as uh, if you've uh, listened before, um, you know that, uh, you know that we've talked about um, uh, living out of the overflow, which you dive into the life of Elijah and, and Moses. And uh, so today we're going to pick up that trail where we left off uh, of part two of the the life and leadership of Elijah. And so we'll carry that on through um, as far as we can get today. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I, I won't I won't say how far we'll get, but uh, when you, when it's we'll, tough when you've written a book on something and then trying to figure out what to say, what to not say. But uh, yeah, we looked for two uh, two podcasts. We looked at First Kings seventeen, and that's all of God uh, getting Elijah ready for his big showdown with uh, King Ahab. And so for chapter 17, uh, we, we saw with Elijah that um, four different times God tells him to do something, and each time he's obedient, and each time it seems things get worse. And it's very counterintuitive. We assume that when you do God's will, things always get better. But uh, but sometimes God is is fashioning us. He's preparing us. And oftentimes the best way to prepare us is not to give us an easy life, but to put us in hard places. And certainly that was uh, the case with Elijah. So then you get to chapter 18, and that is in many ways kind of a the climax to his career. Uh, he has a showdown on the top of Mount Carmel. There's King Ahab, the most wicked king ever to rule Israel. There's about 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah, all the top false religious leaders there and all the nation's leaders. It's just a showdown in front of all the most influential people in the country. And of course, very famously, the showdown is who can call fire down from heaven. And so the false prophets go first and they spend a good part of the day dancing about and praying and crying out to their God, even cutting themselves to try to show their God how serious they are and nothing happens. And then it's Elijah's turn and just the bravado of it all, not only does he call down fire, but he first tells them, let's douse this uh, altar with a lot of water to make it really hard. I mean, that just, uh, the confidence of that. I yeah. I, I just think of, and, and he knows full well that if fire doesn't fall, he's a dead man. There's just no way that Ahab and all those false uh, religious leaders are going to let him live. Um, and so uh, he prays a very simple prayer and fire falls and 
all the nation's leaders are crying out, the Lord God, he is God. They, they, do, they uh, sort of turn around about as fair play. They kill all the false prophets of Baal. And, uh, and then, at the, then as if that was not a big enough day, um, Elijah goes up to the top of Mount Carmel and prays seven times and a drought that's lasted three and a half years comes to an end. So in, in one day, he takes on all of the, the, the major falsehood in his nation, all the false leaders, gets rid of them, and still has time to end a three and a half year drought. <laughs> so yeah. it's not a bad day. Uh, no. And we, we saw last time that uh, it took God three and a half years to get ready, to get Elijah ready for that day. And it says a lot about God that in w- how much can God do in just one day of your life when you are wholly surrendered to him and mm. obedient and filled with the spirit and uh, free of sin and anything that might hold you back. I mean, God can impact an entire nation with just one day of your obedient service to him. Uh, but sometimes it takes a while to get you into that position. Uh, I've, I've seen it, it typically takes God longer to get his servants prepared to serve than it takes for God to actually do a great work. And so after three and a half years, Elijah finally is ready and God uses him in a powerful way. So you get to the end of chapter 18. And the last thing that Elijah does, he's on this mountain and God says, hurry and get down. There's going to be a flood coming. And here's, this is in a land that hasn't even had rain in three and a half years. And so he runs all the way to Jezreel, which is several, quite a few miles away. And Jezreel is also um, where King Ahab has his palace. That's his headquarters. And so when you get to the end of chapter 18, you, you have to kind of just guess what, uh, Elijah's thinking, but it's almost as if Elijah has got to be thinking, okay, for three and a half years, I've been a fugitive. I've been the most wanted man in my country. People are lying about me. There's uh, patrols out looking for me. I've been in a desert. I've been living in with a, w- with a widow, uh, in, uh, uh, in a foreign land, but now I've just, God has just done the greatest miracle that this nation's ever seen. And God sent me to Jezreel where the king lives. And so after, the, and the king was there, he saw the whole thing. So he should probably be summoning me soon and say, okay, Elijah, we need to talk. You just killed all my false prophets. You just proved uh, by fire coming down from heaven that God's on your side. So uh, we uh, let's work Getting things ready out. Getting ready for the, for the biggest promotion of his yeah, life. Yeah, it's like, okay, it's been a tough three and a half years, but it'll all be worth it now. And uh, so you get to chapter 19 and, and it says, and Ahab told Jezebel, uh, by the way, Jezebel, who's kind of the ringleader of all this, didn't even go to the showdown. Uh, and th- that's kind of telling because you realize here's a person who promotes falsehood. And you would think that in a showdown of, let, okay, let's decide who's true. Is Baal the true God or is the God of Israel the true God? Let's find out. You'd think she'd want to know. She, you'd think, oh, yeah, well, if you really believe that your God is the true God, you'd want to be there for him to show off. She doesn't even attend. Because the fact is that there are a lot of people who promote falsehood, who denounce God, who have no desire to actually know the truth. They don't, right. because of the truth, they, they want to determine what the truth is. They're not open to having their mind changed in the slightest. And Jezebel is certainly one of those kind of people. And so she's not even there. And so Ahab tells her that, by the way, that Elijah just killed off all your, your, your priests of Baal and Asherah. And, and so Jezebel, verse two, sends a message to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So uh, Elijah is waiting there any moment for the king to say, we need to have a summit here and uh, negotiate and, and let's work out a deal here. Uh, I'm ready to talk and listen to what God has to say. Instead, he gets a message from Jezebel saying, you just killed all my priests. Well, before this time tomorrow, you're going to be just as dead as they are. Hmm. And so it's not what he was expecting. It wasn't the message he was waiting for. Right. And so you get to verse three and it says, and when he saw that he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, uh, which is about a hundred miles from there, which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. 
Um, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and which would, would have been about five miles, and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than any of my fathers. And this is one of the most bizarre accounts that you're going to find. Here, Here's a guy who just faced down all of the nation's leaders. He faced down King Ahab, and he... Asked, he, he prayed and asked for fire to fall up from heaven and obliterate an entire altar and was compl- absolutely confident God would do that. And then God did. Like if, if I was on a mountain and, and prayed for fire to fall and out of the heavens, a uh, ball of fire came down, obliterated a whole stone altar and everything on it, l- just uh, evaporated a, a ton of water that had been poured all over it. I, I You know, we, we like to think that there's just, we would never again doubt God. <laughs> right. <laughs> that we would always be confident no matter what we faced. Hey, if God just did that for me, then there's just nothing I could face that uh, God's going to have trouble helping me with. But, uh, but, but this is just a fascinating insight, I think, into a leadership issue, which is we all have our Achilles heels. Mm-hmm. We all have our weak moments, uh, our weak spots. And I don't know about you, but there are just certain kinds of people that just get under my skin. You know, I <laughs> like I and I it's funny because I I, I have uh, I, I deal with a number of people that are, have got a lot of rough edges and some some leaders that just rub a lot of people the wrong way. Uh, and uh, they're just kind of blunt or they're insecure. Or they just they say things that are you could take certainly in a, in a wrong way pretty easily. And, uh, and there's a bunch of those kind of folks, uh, even, uh, our, uh, our VP, uh, that, uh, handles my travel and, and arranges our, the meetings I'm a part of. There's a couple of characters he, he always struggles with, and I almost have to just say, Hey, let me just deal with them directly. I know that you just, you, you have to bite your tongue so much and you don't have that much tongue left at this point, <laughs> but, uh, and so, like, there are certain kinds of people that drive other, you know, you know, most people crazy that I'm okay with. It's like, ah, you know, I say, I know he's rough, but he's got some, he's got a good heart, or you know, he's he's <laughs> he's doing a good work, even though it's, you know, it's kind of pretty rough. Um, but then, but then there'll be someone that just I just can't hardly be in the room with, and it's just they just so drive me crazy. And uh, there's certain personality types I think that just rub us the wrong way. Um, and then there's, you know, there's sometimes it's just that it catches us at a weak moment We're we're tired. I've just learned that, uh, yeah. I can just tell there's days sometimes at the end of a day when something goes wrong and it just, I just can't get it out of my head. I, you know, I, and I know full well that if I just sleep on it, I'll, I'll be able to handle this better tomorrow. And, and those are those moments where, it's probably wise not to fire off any emails that night. It's probably yeah. wise not to write out a resignation letter that night. Um, and it's you, you sort of see this with Elijah. Like on Mount Carmel, he, he, he seems invincible. I mean, just like, hey, fire, I need fire from heaven, you know, and there it is. Uh, how could you ever be fear? Like, how could you be afraid of Jezebel when you've just had fire come down from heaven. You just killed 850 prophets of Baal and Asher. Yeah. Uh, you've just faced down King Ahab. Uh, and then you get this threatening letter from this evil queen and you're running for your life, ready to quit. Uh, he runs 105 miles away. Uh, I, and I think it's interesting. And so, you know, what? by the way, one of the questions then for our listeners is, and so what is it that gets to you? You know, where? What, what's your kryptonite yeah. that you might, uh, 99% of the time handle crises and problems uh, with confidence and boldness and faith. But there's just this particular kind of problem that just gets you every time, uh, this particular kind of person. Uh, and I think for leaders, you have to recognize where you're vulnerable. Um, and I, I really appreciate the fact that the Bible has this story in here because Elijah can seem so above us. I mean, just the kind of things he raises dead people back to life. He calls fire down from heaven. He parts like the Jordan river so he can pass over it. Uh, he, he just does all these miraculous, awesome things. And you, and so you, you look at his life and you just say, well, I, 
I, I've got nothing to learn from him. Like he's Superman and I'm just a Clark Kent, you know? <laughs> uh, but then he does this and you realize, okay, he's human too. He's got his weak spots just like everybody else. And, uh, so he, it, and it's interesting. He, 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 he's got a servant with him and he, and he has the servant travel a hundred miles with him. And then, then he really, then he fires him. <laughs> I just, I always just think maybe it's a quirky, uh, you know, perspective, but it's like, look, if you're going to fire the poor guy, don't make him walk a hundred miles yeah. in the desert in sandals and then fire him, <laughs> let him fire him while he still is in his, in his hometown or while he's in the city. But you, this poor servant is traveling a hundred miles and then, then, all right, you're, we're letting you go. And yeah. of course he's, he's letting him go because he's, Elijah is quitting. He's, uh, he's, he, he doesn't need a servant anymore. I mean, obviously it's not because the servant's done anything wrong. It's just that Elijah's saying, I'm not going to be a prophet of God anymore. So I don't need a servant anymore. I'm just, I can go alone. I don't, I'm shutting down the office. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, there, I've said this before, but, uh, you can talk all day long about how, how much faith you have, how powerful you believe God is. But oftentimes, if I want to know how powerful you believe God is, I don't need to look at your theological statement. I don't need to look at your, you know, doctrinal beliefs. I just have to ask you, so what have you quit? What have you given up on? Uh, because the moment you give up on something that God told you to do, you've just declared, I don't believe that with God, all things are possible because mm. Uh, when, when you quit, you're saying, no, this problem is too difficult even for God. When you just get all discouraged and hopeless, what you've said is even God can't solve this problem. And that's basically what Elijah is saying at this point. It, you, you can't believe that with God, all things are possible and then get discouraged. How could you? Yeah. If you really believe that God could take on any circumstance in your life, you, you, you'd never quit because you'd, you'd just be waiting until God came through like he always does. But, but quitting makes an announcement that even God cannot solve this problem in my life. And mm -hmm. so that's why I guess I've always been so reluctant, almost to a fault, about quitting things. That's why I'm still cheering for the same hockey team <laughs> <laughs> 40 years after they've never won the, the Stanley Cup because you, you just keep thinking, but if if I quit, what if I quit just before, uh, God finally did a miraculous work. And yeah. so he, and, and the interesting thing too, is that as we get down a little bit further in this chapter, when God begins talking to Elijah, the, one of the first things Elijah is going to complain about is I'm all alone. <laughs> and, uh, and it's like, Hey, it's just me. I, I'm the only one left. And, God is so patient with us. Uh, there's, I could never be an angel or certainly not God because for lots of reasons, but, <laughs> but one is because, uh, I, I, I would just, I, I couldn't help, but just point out some obvious things like, well, I, I, and when Elijah said, I'm all alone, I'm the only one left. I, I couldn't help but say, well, you weren't all alone. You, you, you traveled a hundred miles with a faithful servant of yours. Like the only reason you're all alone right now is because you have chosen to isolate yourself. And I see this often with discouraged leaders. I see this a lot with discouraged pastors. Yeah. Um, you, when it comes to pastors, you know, well, I'll, I, I do, a uh, meetings all over the country to help, uh, churches that are declining or plateaued that are, that are not growing. And, uh, invariably every time we'll do a conference like that, I'll have some people come up and say, Oh, you know, this has just been great, but I just, it really is disappointing because there's a pastor who has a church just two miles from this place, right? This venue right here, who's really discouraged. His church is, looks it could go under, and, but he just didn't, he didn't come. He didn't want to be here. And it's like, but, the, but this is, this conference is for people just like that. It's it, the whole thing is designed to encourage people just like yeah. that. Why would you not come? Why would you sit at home sulking and depressed when you could drive two miles and have a day where you get a, a nice lunch, you get free books, you get encouraged and loved on and inspired. But it's just the nature of, uh, of discouragement that 
when you start to get discouraged, you start doing things that only make matters worse. And yeah. one of the worst things you can do is isolate yourself. And I've seen this as, with pastors, certainly, where if you if you really push them to be honest, they would say, well, I just not in the mood to hear other people saying how great God is right now or how great being a pastor is or how wonderful their ministry is because they just want to sulk a little. I want to sulk. Yeah. And I just don't, and I don't want anyone to tell me that things could be better or that, uh, sometimes it's, you know, I don't want anybody giving me advice, uh, because I've, I've done everything I know to do and it hasn't changed anything. And so I, the last thing I need is someone to say, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? So I'm just going to to stay isolated. And of course, being isolated rarely ever changes your circumstance. And most of the time it doesn't change you. It's, uh, you need an encounter with God. You need a uh, godly advisor speaking into your life. But uh, one of the, the great signs, the telling signs of uh, discouragement is when people begin to not show up at meetings and they, yeah. they don't come to church or they, they don't call their friends up. Uh, they're, they're kind of missing in action and always a warning sign. Okay, this guy hasn't come to the last three gatherings. What's wrong with him? What, uh, he, it looks like he's going under. Blackaby Ministries is pleased to announce our latest online class, When God Speaks. The six-week class is based on When God Speaks, the Bible study by Drs. Henry and Richard Blackaby, and is designed to help you understand the ways that God speaks to you and will challenge you to be obedient to His voice. This class includes weekly lesson videos, interactive discussion forums, and a live stream Q&A with Henry and Richard Blackaby. Registration is open now. Visit blackaby.org forward slash online classes to register. Links will be in the show notes. So that's where Elijah is. He 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 uh, gets all the way to Beersheba, which is like over a hundred miles from where he was in Jezreel, and then he goes five miles into the wilderness beyond that. And uh, we saw earlier in chapter seventeen that he that God sent him to a wilderness, uh, and he spent some time there where the ravens had to feed him. It was so desolate, and we and we saw there that. One of the ways you get into a wilderness is when God sends you there. Uh, just like Jesus was sent into a wilderness, there are times where God has particular work he wants to do and, and the wilderness is the best place to do it. But, uh, but there's another way to get in the wilderness and that is from fear, from unbelief. That's how the Israelites spent 40 years in a wilderness. Uh, not because God wanted them there, but because they didn't believe, because they were afraid. And I've, I've certainly seen that fear... Uh, can drive you into a wilderness as fast as anything. And I know a number of people yeah. that have spent years in a wilderness because they were too afraid to face the issues in their life. Be- better just to waste my life in a wilderness than face my fears. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've seen that in many different contexts where uh, people just, they, they couldn't bring themselves to believe that God could make a difference. And so they thought, well, let's just I'll just stay in this wilderness going nowhere, just wasting years of my life. And and quite frankly, my life may not be all that spectacular, but it's the only life I've got. <laughs> and uh, and I just don't want to waste it. I, I don't want to look back and say, wow, like years went by in my life and I never grew. I never changed. I never dealt with issues. I just, I just kind of circled around in the wilderness. And, uh, and so here's Elijah just, he he has put himself in a wilderness that God yeah. did not want him to be in. And, uh, and then it says, uh, verse five, uh, then as he, as he lay and slept, and by the way, when it tells you that he slept, um, you can, you can just tell uh, he, he's tired. He's just yeah. tired. And I'll tell you what it, we're, we're, we're perhaps our most vulnerable when we're tired. And, Again, I just can't say it enough. Uh, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is have a long nap, uh, take a vacation. Yeah. I've, I've known some business leaders. I've known pastors that really what they needed more than anything else was just a real deep rest, just to let uh, it would it would just. And it's amazing when you're tired. It doesn't matter if you're trying to read your Bible or pray. Your your body. It's almost like your body can't receive the nourishment that you would normally be getting from that mm. because your mind just can't 
grasp it. Your heart can't really trust it. Um, you, you just have to rest. And, and, and sometimes, you know, sleep can be restorative. Sometimes sleep is also a means of escape. It's, uh, and, and you see this when people are depressed oftentimes. It's almost like if I'm just unconscious, I don't have to think about how miserable I am. So mm. uh, let me just, just sleep away the days and then I don't have to deal with stuff. And so here's Elijah in the wilderness all by himself just wanting to sleep. And, uh, and, I, and I think one other thing to say about that is that um, you, one of the, the, the hardest things for leaders to deal with is disappointment. And I think in part, what, I, I don't think that Elijah necessarily is just terrified of Jezebel. Like It's stories like this that make you, I mean, has made Jezebel kind of legendary. <laughs> if, yeah. if, uh, if, even, uh, uh, if even Elijah could run for his life and t- fall into a fit of, of despair and depression because Jezebel threatened his life, she must have really been a horrible, wicked person. Yeah. Um, but I, I think... Probably what's more accurate is to say, um, when you've been working hard for a long time, you've been holding on for a long time, uh, there just gets that breaking point where, and I think with Elijah, you know, he was on top of Mount Carmel and all the leaders of the nation were shouting out, the Lord God, he is God. And I think Elijah must have thought, all right, it's been a tough road, three and a half years, but we finally had a breakthrough. We, we we're finally going to turn this thing around. And then the next day, instead of progress, you just get another threat. You mm-hmm. get another complaint. And I've seen that so often with pastors and business leaders. Boy, they, they knew that it was going to be tough for a while, you know, and they, they bore down and they, they, they paid the price and they sacrificed. Uh, but it was always with the thought, well, this will be temporary. And then a little hard work and elbow grease, then things will get better. And so they, they held on, they held on, they sacrificed, they worked really hard, they went without sleep. And then right when they thought, okay, we're going to finally arrive, then something else happens. Uh, I've, I've told the story before, I'm sure, of, of just trying to turn my little church around when I was a pastor. And all the work and the changes and the improvements and uh, this all the time encouraging and building up people and making things better. And then right when you you think, uh, okay, we're, we're seeing some progress and things are turning around, you, I'd have a meeting with all my team leaders and uh, instead of people celebrating all the good stuff that happened, they they they'd find one thing that wasn't as good as it could have been. And they would just focus on that. And it was, and it, and and you you look, when you, when you look at that, uh, later you realize, well, you should have just blown that off. I mean, that's, that person's not credible. I mean, there's 99 things that were going great. Uh, the fact they pointed out the one thing that wasn't as good as it could be, you you know, and I think we also just have a, an innate uh, negativity bias as well. Like we could have those 99 things that are perfect. Yeah. But if there's one thing that isn't, then then that's what we're going to fixate on. And that, why, you know, I, and that happens. So that's why you can have 99 people in your organization who love you, but one person that keeps on harping at you. And I, and their voice just seems to have 10 times the clout yeah. of all the people that love you. And, and I've, I've said this before, but I've known pastors who left churches, even though the vast majority of people just dearly love the pastor, but there was a handful of hardened critics that just would not give him any respite. And they just grew tired of that handful. And, and literally a handful ran off someone that was widely loved and respected. And, uh, and Elijah has allowed himself to listen to the wrong voice. And that often happens when you're tired. Yeah. Uh, and I think as not, not just physically tired, but if you, if you could imagine being, uh, your nation's number one fugitive, uh, you've been on the run for three and a half years. And every time you're sleeping at night, you hear a strange noise. You, you want, you, you start and you wonder is, is, uh, this, uh, the, the Ahab's henchman, uh, sneaking up to arrest me and yeah. kill me. And, uh, and it just has kind of worn him out. And then he was living in chapter 17 with a widow. 
and uh, her son died and uh, there are all kinds of emotional trauma and loss and uh, and if we're not careful we we let ourselves get so drained that we become vulnerable and yeah. we now things that we would have just batted away like a an irritating fly uh, now it it drops us to our knees and it's like wow like i it, it just seems so out of proportion to all that you've been successful in how could you let this little thing get to you but but you, you're you're worn down you're tired um and uh and so in this case with elijah he uh he gets to his lowest point um and the one last thing maybe to point out and we'll stop well obviously we're gonna have to take a, one more podcast to get through uh, elijah but <laughs> i had a suspicion um there's just so much here really uh but uh you know just just to look at uh elijah too uh at the end of chapter 18 it's arguably well certainly to this point the most successful elijah has been yeah. his greatest achievement and so you would think that if you've just had your greatest achievement that uh things ought to be just kind of coasting after that but i'll tell you what I, i've just learned in my own experience and studying the lives of leaders often you're the most vulnerable right after your greatest success I don't know yeah. if it's because the enemy just ups his game and says, okay, I don't know if it's because now you're on the enemy's radar screen and we're going to have to, they're going to have to take you down. But, uh, the last thing you want to do is let your guard down right after a great success. Uh, th- because temptations can come. Uh, and I've seen this where, uh, you know, a pastor maybe was, when he's growing his church was uh, trusting the Lord and and praying and staying close to him. But now they've just built this massive new facility and they're packing out the place and the pastor's written a best selling book. And then all of a sudden they make foolish, foolish mistakes. And it's like, yeah. wh- wh- how would you be, why are you vulnerable now to doing foolish, sinful things? You used to have a heart that was so right with God. Well, well, oftentimes success makes us lazy and careless and we, it makes us start to feel invincible. And then all of a sudden something hits us and, and drives us to our knees. And, uh, and so with, uh, Elijah, he's just had his greatest success. And then one verse later, he is running for his life, ready to quit and almost suicidal. And you just think, are we that close? I mean, is how far away are we ever from discouragement and despair? Yeah. It just takes the right message uh, at the right moment. Uh, and all of a sudden, even though we look like a superhero one moment, the next moment we're just in a pity party, just want to be left alone to die. Uh, and all of us as leaders, if, we're, if we don't guard our hearts and minds and our walk with God, any one of us uh, could go from the heights to the depths in a very rapid, rapid way. And, uh, and I think that's just a good caution. And as we kind of yeah. wrap up today with Elijah, just to realize, and I, perhaps even some of our listeners today, uh, Sam, are, would identify with Elijah. They may be weary. They may have been working for a long time to try to turn things around. And still, they keep, they're still getting critics, yeah. complainers. Um, and they, they might just say, you know, wilderness sounds like a really attractive thing right <laughs> yeah. now. Um, and I just say, hold on. Because in the Bible, there are times where even God's finest will get right to the very end of themselves. Uh, but just like things can turn around rapidly for the worse, sometimes you're, you're always just one encounter with God away from a completely transformed life and transformed situation, as we'll discover with uh, Elijah uh, in the next session. Well, this will wrap up part three, and I think we'll have a part four coming <laughs> soon. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, it really makes a difference if you leave a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. We always love hearing from our listeners. So email us at podcast at blackme.org.